Well, good morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, especially a warm welcome if you're visiting with us this morning. We, uh, we're returning to the book of Luke this morning. We've taken a little bit of a break walking through prayers in the Psalms over the past six or so weeks. It's been a mini-series of the myriad of ways and emotions and complexities that our heart feels and how we are to express that to God in adoration and confession and thanksgiving in our supplications. Well, we're going to be turning to, back to the book of Luke for the next period of time in our sermons, and we're at a significant part in the book of Luke. We are in Luke chapter 9, and actually, Luke chapter 9 is a major turning point in the ministry and the earthly ministry of Jesus. In one sense, it's the, it's the apex and conclusion of Jesus' Galilean ministry. From here, from Luke 9 and forward to the crucifixion, we'll learn that Jesus moves towards the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon and Caesarea Philippi and ultimately down to Jerusalem. Now listen, at this point, the popularity of Jesus is growing in leaps and bounds. It's made its way into every local newspaper. Everybody is hearing about this Jesus of Nazareth, and yet it seems that there is a a growing confusion about both his person and his purpose. Who, Who is this Jesus doing all of these wonderful, amazing things? In fact, in Luke 9, verse 9, we see even King Herod Asking, who is this about whom I am hearing such things? A curiosity from the cultural elites, a curiosity from the down and outers. Everybody is wondering who is this Jesus. Probably the most important question that could ever be asked. And next week we will actually hear Jesus ask his very own disciples, who do you think I am? Who am I? But sandwiched, and here's our time this morning, sandwiched between these verses, we learn how the person of Jesus is intricately intricately connected to the mission of Jesus. His identity and his mission cannot be pulled apart. Jesus' identity informs the classroom of his disciples. And the classroom of his disciples always points to the person of Jesus. You can't separate the the, the two. And and so in these few verses that we will read in just a moment's time, we're going to see both truths at work in the life of Jesus. Identity driving mission. Mission pointing forward to the person of Jesus. If you have your Bible this morning, I encourage you now to turn to Luke chapter 9. We're going to read verses 10 to 17. The words will also be on the screen. You're welcome to hear the words as well. Let's turn our attention to the reading of God's word. On the return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethesda. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he, Jesus, said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there are about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. And he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were all satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. This is the word of the Lord. It's given for his church. It's given for our good. Pray with me today. Father, I ask that the trajectory of our hearts this morning might be one of love for Christ, one of obedience to serve you in the midst of our confusions, our limitations, our inadequacies. I pray that you might give us the kind of trust that is needed in this world. We live in such a world where we we long for control. We long to be the point guard, the person who's in charge, the one who has the last say. Would you humble us this morning to take our eyes off of ourselves, to place them on Jesus Christ, the ultimate provider, the one who can satisfy every need in this place. 
the one who's gone to hell and back for us and saved us from our own sin. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure if you've heard the name of Charles Spurgeon. I'm guessing a few in this room have before. A, a British pastor. In one of his sermons titled, Not Sufficient and Yet Sufficient, he says the following. Christ's people are to be more apt to weeping than to bragging, to feel their inability than their ability. The man who does everything for the Lord is the man who can't do anything without the Lord. The man who knows he is a nobody, God will make somebody. I'm not sure if those words, what they do to you today when you hear them, I'm not sure if they make you feel uncomfortable. Uncomfortable precisely because lack in our culture and in our world is more often seen as a burden than a gift. For you and me to come to grips with our own inadequacy can feel more like a crushing weight than an opportunity for growth or maturity. As I alluded to, we live in a world where the myth of self-sufficiency is wallpapered all around us, isn't it? We rarely want to depend on anyone besides ourselves. We want control. We want to have our names great. We want to have the last say. And as the famous song, that, uh, the hymn that Frank Sinatra wrote, I, I'll do things my way. I'll do it my way. And yet many of us in this room, we know the reality well of what it means to come to the end of our rope. Parents faced in this room with their own failure and exhaustion at the end of the day. At work, you find your impatience or your patience growing thin to work along somebody, a particular colleague that you feel that is a near impossible task. Maybe for some high school students or college students here, living boldly or authentically as a Christian just doesn't altogether feel that worth it to you. Your reputation is on the line. What if you lose friends? It doesn't seem worth it. Maybe here in this church today, you, you facilitate or you lead a small group. Maybe you're an elder in this church or you're on a ministry team to a prison. You work with the underprivileged and you wonder, the question comes to mind, what possibly can a group of feeble, weak, sinful people like ourselves offer and bring to this hurting and broken world? What, 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 can, what can we offer this world? Wherever you find yourself today, Wherever you might be today, this passage comes to you and to me, and it has a lot to say about how Jesus meets the needs of his people, and not always in a way that we would expect. It's the place where human inadequacy collides with divine sufficiency. Human inadequacy runs right into divine sufficiency, and maybe I can say it this way. You and I, we must learn to entrust the needs of people to Jesus and then watch how he wants to use you and me as his instruments to accomplish his purposes. Entrust the needs of people to Jesus, but then watch how he wants to use you as the instrument of his purposes. This is what takes place in that pasture, that day, in that desert. Not sufficient, yet sufficient. I have two points today. The first point I want to look at is the dilemma of human inadequacy, the dilemma. Listen again to verse 10. On the return, the disciples return, they told him all that they had done on their ministry trip, all the ways that God had worked miraculously through the disciples. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethesda. This was a ministry retreat, as it were. They were utterly exhausted. They were looking for some rest. You know what it is at the end of the day. You want to kick your feet up, and you need rest. You need to recharge. Verse 11, when the crowds learned of it, they followed him. And Jesus' response was not to push them away. Hey, we're on a ministry retreat here. Leave us alone. What does he do? He welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. But just... By, just by way of a side point here, the sheer compassion of Jesus is clearly on display. And in fact, Mark's gospel, he accounts that he sees, he looks out on the crowd and he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. He sees how lost and vulnerable they were living under the oppression of Rome, living under the he heavy hand of Herod. 
And he sees them and he comes to them to bring a true and better kingdom. Not one of this world, but one that would be bound up in himself. He welcomes them. He sees their true spiritual need will not just be food, as we will see in the story, but a deep spiritual need of relationship to God. But here's where we begin to face the dilemma in verse 12. The day began to wear away. It's getting late. Jesus has been teaching and healing all day, and it doesn't seem like things are slowing down. Night is coming. And so the disciples, they come to Jesus, and they say, it's time to shut her down. It's time to send the crowd away. It's time that we wrap up ministry until morning time, and we can call the people back. You see, we might not sense it as much in our day and age, but the problem of people wandering in a desert without shelter, without food, without lodging is a particular issue. They needed a place to sleep. They had no food. This was a desolate place, as we're reminded. And Jesus knew the crowd was hungry, and yet he was going to satisfy them in due time, but he wanted to fulfill the spiritual hunger that they had. But this is where we find the preoccupation with human inadequacy in the life of the disciples. There's a big problem here, Jesus. We're in a desert, the night is drawing near, there's 5,000 men with women and children, we're probably looking at 10 to 15,000 people in this area. Here are these men who just came back from their mission with Jesus. We had read that they had seen wonderful things, and here they are faced with need. And the immediate knee-jerk reaction of their hearts, the response is one of logic, it's one of realism. It's one of cynicism, and as one pastor notes, as one pastor notes, and they say, send, send these people away. We, we, have, we, have no, we don't have what it takes for the supply of so many people. They had forgotten the commission of Jesus. They had forgotten their utter dependency on Jesus. Let me propose this to you. The one who was with them in the desert that day was the one who was also with them, as we remember, who calmed that raging storm. The one who was in the wilderness with them that day was the one who went to the mountain and exercised authority over all evil and bondage. The one in the wilderness with them was the one who healed the bleeding woman and even raised a dead girl to life. And in this moment, they sensed their own inadequacy. They said, send the crowd away, but see this. Luke chapter 9 is tied up with his identity and it's tied up with his mission. They can't be pulled apart. Jesus wants to teach them here. Jesus is bringing them into the classroom. You see, their solution is focused on what they do not have. All the while, they miss what they do have. Focused on the dilemma, they miss Jesus in front of them. And so Jesus gives them a test, doesn't he? He gives them a test. What does he say in verse 13? He sees the crowds of people, he sees the resources at hand, and he looks to his disciples, which must have been completely infuriating. You give them something to eat. They say, send them away. Jesus says, feed them. You give them something to eat. In other words, Jesus is saying, we're going to carry out this commission as I instructed. No bag, no money, no staff, no food. You're going to become the instruments of God here for my plans and my purposes when the odds are stacked against you. I mean, can you, can you, just, can you picture for a moment the disciples huddling around and thinking, what is, what is Jesus asking here? Is he out of his mind? Look at all these people here. We're, what are we going to do? We're going to look like fools. Again, hear the response. They say, we have no more than five loaves and two fishes. Unless we go and buy this food, which in John's account says that this would take eight months wages. This is a preposterous claim. They start saying, all we have, which in other words mean this job cannot be done. We don't have enough. The math just does not add up. Here's the point where I want us to land as we think about the dilemma of human inadequacy. You and I, we're trained well. It's just in us. It's part of our nature to believe that our lack is a problem. Our inadequacy is a problem, but that Jesus is teaching here that it's actually a gift to his own people. Your need, your lack, your limitation is a gift. In and of ourselves, we are inadequate. Things are impossible in a spiritual sense. We cannot do anything for the kingdom of God in and of ourselves. 
We are so often trained to believe if the right people are on our sides. We've got enough money in the bank account. We have a bold enough leader, a solid enough vision, enough cleverness, enough experience. Surely we can get the job done. We can do this for you, Jesus. We can build a big enough church. We can strategize till we're blue in the face, and we can do this, can't we? How quickly we turn to the how questions before we get to the where question. Where is our faith? Where is the posture of your faith? Who are you depending upon? Now listen, that's not to say that these things aren't helpful aids, ordinary means that God uses to further our kingdom. But what are we ultimately depending upon? Where does our dependency ultimately lie? Our posture ought to be as a beggar who goes to another beggar and says, here is where to find Bread. Listen in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, at least one of the places where Paul speaks about the sufficiency of Jesus. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in and of ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Let me ask you this morning, when was the last time your inadequacy, your limitations, your need drove you to the hands of your heavenly Father, not away from Him? When was the last time you prayed earnestly, Father, give us today our daily bread. Give today your daily provisions because all of my life is dependent upon you. And if you don't come through for me, then things are not going to turn out well. All that we have is from Him. Now, one of the turns or licenses I don't want us to take in the story is that to believe that whenever the odds are stacked against us, whenever you're feeling inadequate or you have need, if you muster up enough faith, if you pray hard enough, that God is going to answer that prayer the way that you think He ought to. God is not some genie. This is not magic. This is not wishful thinking before God. But He will provide the needs in accordance with His sovereign plan for our lives. He will fulfill all that that you need to complete the commission that He has set before you, parents, workers, pastors, elders, missionaries, wherever your work is, cut out in this kingdom of God, God will equip and provide what He's called us to do. The point is that we need to learn to come to the end of ourselves, to recognize our need, and when we do this, something changes in the Christian. Because out of our poverty, out of our, our recognition of need, God makes us instruments of great abundance so that we would see that the power doesn't lie in ourselves, but that His power is greatly displayed in our lives. Do you see the great difference there? Chris, you can't do it. Chris, you you can't plant a church by yourself. You can't just raise your family by yourself. You can't do all the things God has called you to do by yourself. You need to depend on Him. He is the source of life. We need to look to Him for His grace. How often do we sense the call of God to do something by faith? And all we think is, how can I accomplish this? How? How? How how can I do this? We reduce it to our resources, our cleverness to carry out the things that God has asked us to do. And the false assumption behind it, I think, the false assumption behind it is that we believe that God isn't compassionate enough or that He doesn't have the resources to carry His purposes through. When the disciples failed to see, what they failed to see is that when Jesus calls us to do something, is that He gives us the power to do it and that He will be the one with us. This is the dilemma. This is His plan. This is His design that we all better learn to become acquainted with our need if we're going to serve in this kingdom. So we see the dilemma of human inadequacy. But of course, this is not the end of the story. Point two, we don't just see the dilemma of human inadequacy. We see the marvelous sufficiency of Jesus. We see the marvelous sufficiency of Jesus. Listen, he has men full of unbelief, not looking to him. And in verse 14, he says to his disciples, he goes ahead with the mission and he says, have them sit down in groups of 50. I'm about to show you what I've commissioned you to do. So everybody sat down And Jesus taking the five loaves and the two fish and other accounts, a small boy's lunch. He looked up to heaven. He said a blessing over them. 
that he broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate. And all were satisfied that day. Not, not a little crumb each for each member who's sitting out in the grass. All were full. All were satisfied at the end of the story. Why? Finally, the little in the lack is placed in the right hands. The inadequacy of the disciples becomes a showcase for the marvelous sufficiency of Jesus. It's this inadequacy that brought uh, that is brought to Jesus that leads to a glad participation and an abundant satisfaction. We know well as we've gone over this, it's the people who failed in unbelief have now changed to become the servants of the provision of the king. Part of me wonders in this story if this, if this miracle wouldn't have been all the more glorious if Jesus just did it himself. I see your unbelief. You guys don't think this can happen. Step aside. I'm, I'm going to handle this myself. But what is it in the graciousness of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus that he chooses to use feeble, sinful, unbelieving participants like his disciples? Feeble, sinful participants like you and me. This, this is the richness of the gospel of how God takes ruined sinners God takes people messed up like you and I, fumbling around in this world, as people are going to participate and serve in his kingdom, treasures, uh, people with treasure in jars of clay, to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. This is his design. This is what he desires to do through his church. So when you have little, wherever you're faced today, as that's being conjured up in your mind as we think about this today, the answer is not to run away. The answer is not to send them away. The answer is to bring it to Jesus, to put the lack in the right hands, to receive the invitation to come before him. So if Jesus is the Lord of, 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 of nature and storm and evil, if he's the Lord of sickness and death, surely he is the Lord over fish and bread and everything you are holding that says, I don't have enough, Lord. I don't have enough. We go in mission. We are commissioned. All of Luke chapter 9 in commissioning his disciples is a, fail effort, a failed effort in mission if we don't depend on the provision of Jesus with us. We just can't miss this. So through your prayers this afternoon and this week, as you look upon the difficulties of unbelieving children and sickness in your family and wondering what it means to be a Christian in Edmonton and just feeling the lack of courage in your own life. Don't look to your own sufficiency and inwardly. Place your lack in the hands of Jesus. Look to him to see his marvelous sufficiency for you and me. We can't miss this. But there's one more thing that we can't miss here. Jesus in this desert is showing something wonderful. He's showing that he is the true and better Moses. He is the one that the people have been waiting for. Indeed, the kingdom is at hand. He is the true and better king that Herod could never offer, that any of the Roman Empire could never offer them. Jesus comes on the stage here and has said, the king has arrived. I'm the one who can ultimately provide for you where no human adequacy could ever do. Don't forget in Exodus 16, 15 and 16, it says this. The people are all gathered in the desert. Here's the imagery here. Here's the parallel that when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as, you, as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in its tent. The language here of desolate place, of desert place, Mark repeats even three times is to show this astounding provision of food in the wilderness, this greater fulfillment, this fullness of once, what once was shadowed in the Old Testament. Who did that before? It was Moses. You remember the question of Herod? Who is this? The question he will ask his disciples in a few verses, who am I? And Jesus is declaring his personhood. He's declaring his identity. When we see this provision of food in the wilderness, we know this is the greater Moses. Indeed, the kingdom of God is at hand. And I want you to hear this. 
This miracle of bread and multiplication and provision in the desert points us to a more miraculous and final provision of what Jesus would finally free us from with his own body and his own blood upon the cross and where he would feed us with like signs at the table of bread and wine to hungry sinners like you and and I. The people on that day, they ate and they were satisfied. But you know what? They became hungry again. Of course they did. But what Jesus is telling us here, what Jesus is pointing us towards is that he is a host of a meal and the sustenance of a meal where we will never be hungry again by faith. That he would ultimately satisfy all of our desires and to all who come to him as hungry sinners. And all of this anticipates a far greater meal than this one. If you're a Christian in this room today, all of this points forward to a wedding supper of the Lamb, a final feast where we will never be hungry again. And Jesus' promise to us is to bring our lack, to come to him in dependency, that we would feast on him by faith, that we would not be empty. Until that day comes, as we carry out the king's mission, let us remember, as I had mentioned earlier, that we are one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. This is the truth of what it means to follow after Jesus. We bring our human inadequacy to him, and we see his marvelous sufficiency of provision. And let me just say this. If you're here today, you're not sure what you believe, or you're sure that you don't believe, the invitation is for you this morning to come to Jesus Christ, to bring your exhaustion, to bring your sin, to bring your guilt, to bring your weariness into the hands of Jesus. He will not turn you away. And that's precisely the place where not all of your problems will necessarily go away, where you will enjoy the most peaceful life, but you will have a sure and steady hope and satisfaction in this life of one who can truly feed you where no one else can. This invitation is for you. Come to Jesus Christ today. Come and welcome to him. Let's pray. Father, once again, we marvel at this invitation of grace. We marvel 2,000 years ago of you, how you provided this incredible miracle that we are to look back on and, and feast on by faith, but we also trust by your spirit that you're here today. And so we bring our weariness, we bring our exhaustion, we bring our sin, we bring our failures and limitations to the cross this morning, and we ask that you'd fill us again. Give us the grace that is needed for another day. Give us to this day our daily bread. And more than anything physical, give us Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name.